people will know you as you know red bull athlete big wave charger somebody who is who has faced down fear far more than than the average human being um tell us a little bit about that side of your life to start with how you got into big wave surfing um but also just how the hell you deal with that it's interesting when you say it's like you face down fear more than the average person one thing i've learned like over the years is like fear is so relative to the individual so like certain things scare certain people more but the average person man going around and people in all different walks of life from all over the world man you can find people dealing with the craziest amounts of fear and like showing unbelievable amounts of resilience just in everyday life like that's the one thing i've kind of learned because it it's just so individual like none of us have the same fears we got different sort of you know predetermined personality genetic sort of traits that make us see the world different and then we got past childhood experiences that are different so it's like the world's just so different for everyone and that's like for me just speaking to you live like say say we do this live that for me is more nerve-wracking than surfing 50 foot waves or like speaking to an audience live <laughs> like so it, it, it's funny like people are always like that's amazing that you surf those big waves and it like it looks spectacular and stuff but for me it's like learning how to do public speaking is for me it's way more amazing to like that was way bigger fear for me so um yeah it's interesting i got into um uh surfing my my dad surfed when he was young well and then uh he, he went off and studied medicine became a surgeon so sort of gave up surfing but as soon as i was old enough to surf he kind of picked it back up again and then uh, like he taught me how to surf and and my mum used to come out she's from over in holland so she didn't grow up at the beach but she she just like had no other choice like my dad loved the beach she she learned how to ride a bodyboard so she was always out there with us and my sister surfed so um from a pretty young age i was surfing i was i was pretty terrified of the ocean though when i was little like i never would have imagined being a big wave surfer ever um like my mum used to have to paddle out on a boogie board and rescue me over and over again when i was young which is pretty embarrassing especially when you grow up in maroubra surrounded by that rough tough neighborhood and your mum paddles out in a fluoro yellow boogie to rescue in front of everyone <laughs> but um uh i think then kind of um i got to the point where i could surf well like i wasn't like the top level surfer um and then i had that that sort of fork in the road where i didn't think i was ever going to be good enough to be a championship tour level surfer you know but then i grew up around kobe abernon who was at that point he was like kind of stepping away from competitive surfing and going down that free surfing route and and a lot of what he was doing was centered around big waves and it was like all the magazines and stuff were loving just photos of huge waves at that time and i kind of just uh so sort of followed him like around like a lost little sheep for for a couple of years and um i just realized that in reality the only way i was ever getting a career as a surfer it was it wasn't going to be on ta on talent it wasn't going to be to do with me out surfing other surfers it was only going to be from me riding waves that other people didn't want to ride like that was the only path to that and as scary as that was i just would i've always rather do that than than having to go back and and work so i um i just put everything invested everything into that did you have a a process of of um yeah, how you how you push yourself over the over the edge, not not only like literally over the edge of the wave and into it, but also over the edge, like leaving the shore, like staring at those big waves and and thinking, right, I'm going to get out there. Did you have a mental process that you kind of went through to kind of do it, or did you just push and go for it? Yeah, there's a combination of things. Like there's all the different things that I talk about when when I deliver talks to audiences, like I'm going to be doing, like I'm really excited for up at the at the surf festival. So, um, uh, all of it starts before you're on the beach going to surf. Like to manage fear and anxiety in your life, you, the only way through it is experience. Like you got to build a skill set and get knowledge that's relative to the thing that scares you and then you use the skills and the knowledge to master the environment so you got it it's all about doing all the hard preparation work so that the day you turn up on the beach and it's a little bit bigger than what you've surfed like you, you're ready to push yourself and take yourself on and then the fear at that point's manageable but if you turn up to a situation 
with no experience, nothing at all. Like there's a whole lot of different mental hacks and tips and techniques to manage anxiety that are, that are quite beneficial, but without experience, they don't work. Like I, you could do all the different meditative techniques, breathing techniques, like uh, all kinds of different things on the day to manage your anxiety. But man, if you're not ready for it, you will freak out in the moment, you know, like it just, they, they don't work. They're a good tool, but um, yeah. So the process is just, it, it, you know, like for surfing, you know, it's, it's all about being fit, strong, comfortable, getting held underwater for a long period of time. So it's that type of training. And then it's learning all about the wave break that you want to go and surf. Um, and then, so that it becomes a question of motivation then, because you really got to want to do it to, to do all that, um, to get all that experience one of the good things that I always found really motivating that helped me was just always surrounding myself w with surfers that would surf bigger waves than me and, and kind of push me over the edge. Like, and I was lucky to grow up with, with Kobe Abaddon, um, a bunch of other amazing big wave surfers, Richie Vass, Evan Forks, like all from, from home in Maroubra and, um, and just always traveling to surf with them. It would just help that, that little extra motivation, you know? Now you've um, obviously your your keynote that we're really excited about seeing um, coming up on the Friday, Friday the eleventh of March at the festival. Um, that's all about how fear translates. You know, fear in in the extreme situations like you've had actually translates to um, day to day life and anxiety and and those sort of things, as you mentioned. Um, before we start talking about that, um, let's just. Uh, appeal to our audience perhaps and and um talk about your most terrifying moment the moment you've really feared the most um while in the ocean uh in the ocean i'd have to say there's a, a moment when i got smashed oh which one is worse i i got smashed at shipstones bluff once and uh was knocked unconscious and I think, I don't know exactly what happened. I think my head hit the reef and I, but I had a helmet on and there was a big hole in the helmet and um, I was knocked unconscious. And all I remember was like kind of waking up and I was underwater and I had kind of no idea where I was. It was just pitch black and kind of dark and cold. And it was like, it felt like a lifetime, but it probably happened in a, in a second. But to me, I was just like this eerie space of not knowing what's going on. And then then I kind of like broke the surface and, and got a breath of air and, and saw like the big uh, rocks at ship stands. And, and at the same time, like simultaneously, I just had this nerve pain running down the back of my spine all the way into my arms and my legs. And, and I thought I'd broken my, my neck like when I'd hit the bottom. And, and it was just like that. It was like this split second of being absolutely terrified, like, but but then like it, it passed like as I started to be able to move my my legs and stuff, but um I knew it wasn't like debilitatingly bad, but it there was just that tiny little window of time that just freaked me out, and it took me, it took me like a year and a half I reckon to get over it. Like physically, I, I it it only took like sort of three months till I could surf again, but. Man, it freaked me out for a long time. Like you just get it in the back of your head that that's going to happen every time you surf somewhere big. So that was probably the scariest. Yeah. Wow. I, I can't even imagine it. And I'm sure, you know, most of our viewers can't even begin to comprehend what yeah. that's like. But uh, what you've done with this, uh, with this keynote that you've now taken all over the world, yeah, you've, you've screened it or you've performed it all over the world. Um, you've taken those experiences and related them to your personal life on land as you said you know your fear of public speaking and things like that um but then also um shown your audiences who are just regular day-to-day -day people they might not even be surfers or, or anything that um the fear you experience is parallel to fear they experience in totally different ways and how to manage that um, how does that relationship work? That relationship between the fear that you've experienced in extreme circumstances, but then also the day-to-day -day fear that you might experience with public speaking or personal anxiety and things like that. 
Yeah, I think that that's why my story and my keynote resonates with people because it's not that like people think they're going to watch someone that's just doing something that they would never do. And that person's just like, like they think that I was just born crazy or, you know, like got some sort of brain defect. I just don't feel fear like the normal person. But I think that's where it resonates because I, I explained to them that that's not true. I feel it just as much as anyone else. And in other areas of my life, I feel it more like I'm hyper introverted. So, so public speaking to me was terrifying. Like I've, I've read from, I stood up in front of a classroom once in my life and, and had to read from a book and I couldn't even read, I like stuttering mess. And I can still see clear as day, like all the kids laughing and stuff. I swear, even the teacher like kind of had a smirk. Like it was like, and from that point, I never spoke in front of a classroom again and like failed. It would make me fail English like every, every other year because I'd like just wouldn't go to class when you had to do like the debates or anything like that. Um, so I avoided it my whole life, but that, that's where I try and parallel it for audiences. Like I learned how to manage fear in the ocean in, in surfing big waves. And, um, and I thought that for sure that would be the biggest fear I'd have to overcome, but it wasn't like to, to step into a career of public speaking. I had to take everything I'd learned in the ocean and then put it to the test at something totally different. And for me, it was kind of good. And for audiences, when they listen, it's nice because they see the same process working in totally different fields. And, and more often than not, they, they can kind of relate to the public speaking fear a little bit more. So yeah, I think that's why it, um, it works. Yeah. And, and I do it with audiences all over the world from every different demographic, culture, nationality, like just everywhere. And it, and it seems they get the same response. So uh, it, I think it kind of proves that humans all over the world are just, we're all the same, really. Was there a, a specific moment that um, that triggered you into this this kind of new path that made you think, oh, I want to share what I've learned and, and how I deal with fear with others and, and help others deal with it as well? Um, years ago, when I was probably 20, 324 one of my major sponsors it was a sunglass company and the marketing manager i was friends with he had sponsored me and he told me this is what i should do as a career after surfing public speaking because his best friend did it was a uh, an amazing mountain climber and um and backcountry skier and he had set up this business in america and um and he said, you need to do this. And I was just like, no way I will ever do that <laughs> as a career. And uh, I wish I had a, like learnt it way back then, but I, I avoided it for a long time. But eventually he um, introduced me to his friend and uh, his friend kind of just showed me the ropes. And a couple of times out of the blue at, at events where he was doing jobs, he would drag me up on stage when I wasn't like he'd get me there by saying no you don't have to get up on stage but then he'd drag me up and and just do q and a's and slowly i'd get comfortable and then it was just that process of doing every public speaking course under the sun and and uh just that constant training like in big wave surfing in the ocean you got to like do that repetitive breath hold training which sucks and and for this you got to like kind of just speak in front of a camera record yourself watch it back, get a professional to watch it, give you notes on how bad you are and everything you need to change, go through that nerve wracking, awkward moment of watching yourself on camera, redo it and do it again and do it again and do it again. It's like, that's the process. That's getting the experience. So that's, uh, I, I, and like initially it was just financial, like you get paid really good money to do this. So initially that's all it was, but, um, when I started getting feedback from just individuals at the events, like personal messages on my social media, um, just saying how that, like I just inspired them to do one little thing different and it had made like a world of difference in their life or they used some little technique or just something positive happened and they're really appreciative. Like it's, once I started getting those messages, it's like, it's it was more, fulfilling for me like it felt better than anything i'd had done in my surfing career so um i feel pretty lucky to be able to do this as much as it still makes me nervous and i you know i don't love the moment when you're walking on stage but when you get those messages it uh it feels pretty good is there uh is there one um of those messages one story in particular that's really kind of struck a chord and 
made you realize that, hey, what you're doing is actually changing lives? Yeah, this one lady wrote to me not that long ago um, and she wrote the message just went kind of like I, I watched your talk and then followed a bunch of, of your stuff on social media. And I just want to say I went from everything I learned about fear from you. She said, I went from being a single mother of three, three working two jobs in, in Tweed Heads here. Um, never thought I was good enough to do anything beyond those those two jobs. And then within like a year, she was leading a 50 person team at one of Australia's biggest tech companies. I think it was like SAP or Oracle or something like that. Like, and, and she wrote this nice message and I was like, man, that was insane. Like it was such a nice thing. So um, yeah, just ones like that, that stick out. Yeah. Yeah. It's incredible. I'm sure it, it does have a, like a groundbreaking effect on some people, yeah, especially people with, you know, dealing with, um, with mental issues like um, depression and anxiety and things like that, the really crippling um, mental barriers that people have with, um, with public situations, but, you know, all sorts of aspects of, of their daily lives. Yeah. Yeah. It's, um, it, it just, I think sometimes it provides a, just a little spark of, of, uh, of inspiration. And, and I tell like another pretty emotional story that, that kind of has another person within the story. And, um, and it seems to generate that story seems to generate like this, this emotion of like gratitude within the audience where they, they see this story that I'm telling about some kind of about someone else and myself, but that they see that and they kind of had this moment where, Oh, you know, like I'm actually pretty lucky. Like even though things for some people in the audience are going really badly, you know, there's no limit to how badly it could be going, but often they see that and they're just like, hold on a minute. I'm actually, you know, things aren't too bad. And then that, 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 tiny little shift you know is just enough of a, a little bit of a catalyst you know i'd uh, i'd love to have more time to work with people like for longer periods of of time to see evolution and actually give you know more insight but usually i only get like a an hour with an audience which is not much how you consider doing like one-on-one -on -one mentorship and things like that yeah i think i'll do it down the track um i, I like referring people more often than not to it to psychologists like it's like like I, I growing up as an athlete like you go and see a sports psychologist or a psychologist to get better at performance whereas the the stigma around seeing a psychologist in the general public it's like oh you only go to see a psychologist to um you know if you're in a really bad way which is i feel like everyone should just use the opportunity as the the way an athlete does you know because they're quite accessible now like through people's work and the government and stuff and it's like you're better off going to use the psychologists and chat to them you know just to be better at life basically you know and and avoid going down any negative situation so i've got a few different um like companies of psychologists and stuff that i usually kind of refer clients to and uh and they do a better job than me sort of long term maybe if i do a little bit more study i'd uh i'd be comfortable doing sort of more detailed um personal coaching down the track yeah. Now, a lot of people, I think probably people maybe that push themselves to, to come to your talks, um, but certainly people that should come to your talks, they're probably doing that thing that you did at school where they found something they fear or they, they find this place of fear in their lives and they just avoid it at all costs. They push it away and they, they don't go anywhere near it. They just shut it out of their lives. But that can be really constrictive um it can be socially constrictive it can be uh, really constrictive in terms of work workplace and work advancement um what would you say is the benefit of rather than pushing it away to embracing it and and dealing with it and working through that fear well there's a benefit only if there's something on the other side of that fear that's valuable to you like I've got lots of other fears that I just avoid at all costs because on the other side of them, there's nothing that important to me, you know, and it's stressful taking on a fear, but it's kind of, if you take the time to like, just kind of figure out what you do really either want from life or you want to avoid like worst case scenarios that might catch you if you don't take action, you know, and, and you really like spend a month or so just 
writing it down, figuring it out across different aspects of your life, when it's business, career, finances, personal life, relationships, um, health, like and figure that out, then you can see like, okay, what's actually holding me back when I'm honest with myself? Like, what are those little fears that might be standing in the way? Like the, the fears of rejection that keep you from meeting the love of your life or, you know, fear of embarrassment of not wanting to walk into a, a gym and it keeps you from your health goals or, you know, fear of missing out on, on other things so you won't sacrifice your time. Like there's, there's a whole lot of different fears. It's just like if you're clear on what you really want to achieve, then it becomes clear which fears to take on and then it's like something happens when as you build that experience and knowledge like your brain shifts it takes this subtle shift where what you used to perceive as anxiety like if you feel like oh i'm so anxious about doing this all of a sudden it's almost like you have a similar feeling but you perceive it as excitement now and and when that happens you can get really addicted to that and and it for me i feel like that's a pretty good addiction if you point it in the right direction because it's like you overcome that fear there and then you're like hold on a minute i want more of this and you can just point it at different fears in your life that are holding you back and it's a good process man it's a, a learning process that you can do for the rest of your life so yeah it's pretty good wow that sounds excellent that sounds absolutely incredible um, Mark, thank you so much for your time today we've been on point with Mark Matthews talking about his amazing keynote speech that he's going to be giving at the Noosa Festival of Surfing on the 11th of March um, at 8 p.m. at the J Theatre. Uh, Life Beyond Fear by Mark Matthews. We can't wait to hear it. Mark, thank you so much for your time today. I really appreciate it. Too easy. I uh, can't wait to see you all up at the festival. It's going to be a whole lot of fun to actually be standing in front of an audience again instead of uh, doing everything virtually. So I'll, uh, I'll see you all there. And fingers crossed we get some more of this awesome swell that's been around. Mm -hmm.